Uh, first of all, the, the high water point of American foreign reporting, measured in terms of amount of foreign news in newspapers, was in colonial America. It was at a time when we had no editors and we had no reporters. What we had was colonial printers who had newspapers and when ships came in from overseas, they would offload both newspapers from Great Britain and other places and they would offload letters of people, true foreign correspondents who had written back to the colonies and they would publish them in their newspapers. It was not unusual for Benjamin Franklin's newspaper, which was not the first, but one of the first, to actually have the entire front page and parts of the inside all foreign news. Now, uh, you know, sometimes by our standards, it's, some of this was rather bizarre. One of my favorite examples of that being one newspaper uh, would publish, always insist on publishing the oldest news first. So if they couldn't fill up the paper with, they had too much news to fill up the paper, they wouldn't start with the newest news, they start with the oldest news because then next week they'd fill you in and bring you up to date on the oldest news, something that, of course, journalists today would never do. Uh, a second period happens around about the middle of the 19th century when we, when we get to the point of having um, um, mass market media. And I'm gonna say more about this uh, in a minute. But once you had to make money, from selling news and you had to pay for foreign reporting, uh, things began to change. Uh, and so we, we, we began to see an, uh, a sort of a, 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 a pattern that sets in, in motion. Uh, we started seeing special correspondents. Those were correspondents who actually worked for a newspaper. They were called and still are by many people the specials. One of the great ones was George Wilkins Kendall of the uh, New Orleans Times Picayune who covered the war in Mexico in 1846 and did such an extraordinary job that newspapers all over the United States used his copy. They sent it up by Pony Express. And one of the reasons that he was so effective was, in addition to having actually riders in Mexico take the copy to the coast, he also had ships meet the boats that were bringing his stories to uh, New Orleans with type equipment, typesetting equipment on the boats and they'd set the type on the boats so when they landed they could have the stories right out on the street. Uh, next was our friend Henry Stanley, who uh, made news by finding Dr. Livingston uh, in East Africa for the New York Herald. The most important part of that story, that actually is a story he actually got and didn't make up, uh, which, is, which is to his credit. Uh, what's more interesting is that James Gordon Bennett, who had sent him, actually sent him and then forgot he sent him, then decided he'd send him some money so he could keep looking for Livingston, but was always very jealous of the fact that Livingston had, uh, that uh, Stanley had gone and gotten the story and, um, uh, and felt that he, living, he, Bennett, should get much more credit. Uh, it's also interesting if you look at the stories that there is no byline on uh, Stanley's stories. They're all told in the first person, but there's no byline. Uh, but the point was that the Herald went out and tried to get news. They, they, he, uh, James Gordon Bennett expended a lot of money to go out and get foreign news and use it as a competitive advantage for his newspaper. There's another character who's forgotten uh, named George Smalley, uh, a wonderful journalist who was a master of organization. Uh, he set up a permanent bureau uh, in London for the New York Tribune and he was very famous for what, was, what he called his methods, uh, which was ways to organize coverage of major events including wars. Uh, one of his great accomplishments was to actually outfox William Howard Russell, who was the famous correspondent of the Times of London in the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, and he set, he set a stage for the idea that you had to organize news, you just don't send somebody out there, but when you're going after a big story, you've got to put a lot of different people in place and you've got to devise st strategies to get the news from the battlefield to, uh, in this case, London and then back to New York. The next stage comes with our friend uh, Victor Lawson in the Chicago Daily News. Uh, his, his core of foreign correspondents were eventually syndicated, uh, their work was syndicated to more than 100 newspapers. Uh, and he set the stage for what would be serious, a serious foreign service, as it were. Uh, the first Pulitzer Prize ever given for, in the category of foreign reporting was to uh, Paul Scott Maurer, one of the great, great journalists of the 20th century. Uh, and as a matter of fact, his brother, who was also on the paper, Edgar Anselmauer, won it three years later for covering the Nazis. Uh, I'm going to say more about Maurer later. But by the way, if anybody wants to read a wonderful book, you ought to read a book called Our Foreign Affairs, written in the early 20s by Maurer. It predicts, it predicts the way the world was going to go with amazing accuracy and 
including predicting energy crisis. Uh, then we had what I would call the golden age of journalism, the period between the two world wars. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for this. Uh, one was there were lots and lots, even though we think of that as a period of American isolationism, there were lots of foreign correspondents abroad in that period. Uh, they were not only with newspapers and, and news services, of which there were many, which don't even exist today, like the International News Service and the United Press and Associated Press uh, and Consolidated Press, there were a long list of them. Uh, there were also magazines that sent reporters abroad and uh, gave them a huge uh, freedom to write. Uh, and because the costs of living abroad were relatively so cheap, with the amount of money you were paid by these magazines, for example, um, and given the fact that living was so cheap, you could, you could stay abroad and live quite comfortably uh, on your salary. Uh, an example I like to use is uh, a guy named Edgar Snow, who was one of, also one of the great reporters of the 20th century who covered China. And he wrote his first story for the Saturday Evening Post in 1935. And he got $750 for that story, which is kind of a lot of money in those days, and was able to pay his entire food bill and his rent for the entire year on 750 bucks. Also, it was a time when we had um, radio coming on, which made a difference. And it was also a time when, and this is, I think, very important to all of us, uh, in all kinds of capacities, not just journalism, uh, and not least of all diplomacy. It was a period in American history where Americans were really liked overseas. And it gave journalists tremendous entree. One of the reasons that Edgar Snow did so well is he was the first to write about Mao and the Chinese Communist Revolution. Nobody really knew what it was about until he went up to uh, Bao'an to interview uh, Mao Zedong and others. And the reason, he, the reason they wanted him was he was an objective reporter and he was an American and he wrote for important news outlets. Uh, today, being an American newspaper man or woman is not necessarily uh, a reason to get invited to, to have a good story. Uh, now, American journalists are often targets. And then, of course, there's another thing that made that a golden age, and that was there were very important stories going on. The run-up to World War II, uh, the rise of communism, fascism, uh, a, recognition, a recognition of growing interdependence.